All right, so we're going to move into the next chapter. It deals with ideal gas mixtures. And the first half is very standard, pretty straightforward. If you have a good background in physics, big background in chemistry, it's pretty straightforward. We'll talk about molar descriptions and mass descriptions of ideal gas mixtures. Partial pressures, partial volumes, how to do energy calculations, first law for an ideal gas mixture. Second law, entropy calculations for ideal gas mixtures. And we prefer to use constant specific heats. So how to get the specific heat of an ideal gas mixture. It's pretty straightforward. We close with some application problems. Do I, can I apply conservation of energy to a closed system when I have an ideal gas mixture as the fluid? Can I apply you know, open system, first law and second law? So first law, second law, open system, closed systems. Now we're using ideal gas mixtures. All right. Then the last half is psychrometrics. That's a new word, psychrometrics. It's an application. Well, the air that you're breathing is a great ideal gas mixture. It's nitrogen, oxygen, water vapor. CO2 and some other trace stuff, right? So psychrometrics is the study of moist air. That's the domain of mechanical engineers who especially work in the comfort industry and they design and lay out uh, the HVAC systems and buildings and worry about things like co occupant comfort in uh, built environments, in uh, air aircraft, in automobiles, just wherever. So first description, what is a mole fraction? So you have an ideal gas mixture. It's made up of so many moles of component A and so many moles of component B. If you add them together, you have the total amount. And so the mole fraction would be the amount of A divided by the total amount. Wouldn't that be a fraction? What symbol would you like to use? Y. Y is the used chosen symbol for mole fraction. So mole fraction of A. Most of the time they say the mole fraction of component J or component I. That will be the amount of that component I or J. Here, let's stay with J. Divided by the total in the mixture. And then if you summed up all of the mole fractions over all of the J's, by definition, it has to be one, isn't it? Isn't it? Sure. What about volume fraction? Well, that would be the volume that uh, is occupied uh, by the component A to, to the total volume. If you could take A at the same temperature and pressure. So. Maybe I put a box here and I put in some uh, gas molecules like this and then I put in some gas molecules that are mixed. And if I could take, and I know I have the temperature and pressure here, if I could take that box and separate it into two sides, maybe all the A are over here and all of the B are over here but they're all, both compartments have the same temperature and the same pressure as original, then this would be like the volume of A divided by the total volume would be the volume fraction. I don't know what we want, V sub F, volume fraction for A. Okay? But guess what the volume fraction is related to the mole fraction if it's a ideal gas mixture? The mole fraction, the y sub uh, j, is equal to the volume fraction of that component. Why is my computer not running so well? Okay. Um, how about this? The ideal gas equation is P V equal to N R T. True. So the total volume occupied by the total amount N is equal, the volume is equal to N, the total amount, times RT over P. Can I also say that's applicable for the component I 
the mount of A, or the mount of the volume occupied by not I, but A. And then it's R T over P. And they're just same pressure, same temperature. Yeah. Uh, so this is that volume. It's a smaller volume occupied by A. Uh, I should have emphasized this is an R bar, isn't it? What's the difference between R and R bar? Right, the molar mass. And so R bar is a universal gas constant. R is for whatever specific uh, gas. So you can see then that um, V sub A over V, I just replace here, I get that it's the N sub A over N. Hey, that's my mole fraction. So the volume fraction is the same as the mole fraction for ideal gas mixtures. What about mass fraction? Well, some textbooks um, use X for mass fraction. Very confusing to students. So they use M sub F for mass fraction. Okay, it's just MF is the mass fraction. What do you think it's defined as? Mass fraction of I. It would be the mass of I divided by the total mass of the mixture. All right. Now, um, how do I jump back and forth between mass fraction and volume fraction or mole fraction? These are the same. Just think about mole fraction. Okay? Well, what you do is you say, uh, what is the relationship between m sub i and n sub i? Do I, here's a clicker question for you. Do I either multiply by the molar mass of that component, or do I divide by the molar mass of that uh, uh, component? Which equation is correct? Equation A is correct, or equation B is correct? I take the N, that's how much there is in, let's say, kilomoles. Do I multiply it by M to get the mass? That's answer A is correct. Or do I divide by M to get the mass? That's B. Do you need more time or are you good? Professor, I'm looking at my equation sheet as fast as I can. <laughs> Well, some things you shouldn't rely on equation sheets for, right? All right, let's take a look. Uh, first of all, what are the units on big M, SI units? Kilograms per kilomole or grams per mole. That helps a lot. All right? So the answer is A. True? Isn't it A? How did, if you didn't use the units of M, having memorized the units of M, how else would you recall that that's the correct formula? Um, so you, you, you went back here and you said P, B is equal to M, R, T, and or here, let me write it up here. PV is equal to MRT, right? And so M is not N, but how does how do you get how do you how does your brain work on that one? I know you put a M divided by M, and the N times the M gives you the mass. And R is R bar divided by M. Maybe that's it. Is that the way you were thinking? Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I know there's different ways that people remember things. Okay. Uh, I, I remember the units, and I think through units to help uh, avoid errors. So um, it, the best thing to do is set up a little table of uh, mole fractions, and I'm going to do that, but let's wait and I'll do that in an example. Before I leave this page, you can have a molar analysis or a gravimetric analysis. 
professor, why do you make these words make no sense to me? What, gravimetric analysis, I don't under, okay, look it. That's the word out there used in the literature, used in the shop, so to speak, used in the literature, the people that are doing the discussion of this. And that basically is reporting your mass fraction. What do you think the mole fraction, reporting your volume fraction or mole fractions? These are at ideal gas mixtures. At one time I gave a, a, a pop, uh, not a pop, a multiple choice question on an exam. The student didn't like it. It all bent out of shape. He thought we would know the difference between a molar, anal molar analysis and a gravimetric analysis. It's in the book. And I'm just trying to help you, okay? It's a gravimetric analysis. Somebody says a gravimetric analysis, it's 10% methane. Mass fraction is 10%. Somebody says volumetric analysis, methane's 10%. Mole percent is 10%. Got it? Right? All right. All right. How do we go between these molar description and mass description? Well, you can usually start on a molar basis. And so let's say I have component I is equal to uh, 1, 2, and 3. I have three species, okay? Maybe I give them names. Maybe it's a carbon dioxide, maybe it's oxygen, and maybe it's nitrogen. That's my ideal gas mixture. And somehow, they give me the mole fractions on a molar basis. Maybe this is 70%. Uh, maybe this is 20%. Oh, what do you think the mole fraction of nitrogen has to be if there's only three in the mixture? 10%. That's right. If this doesn't add to 100, look for an error. All right? I usually can get the molar mass in some kilograms per kilomole. Okay? What is the molar mass of carbon dioxide? 44. I know there's some change on it, but 44. What about oxygen? 32. Excellent. Nitrogen? 14 and 14? 28. Good enough. So what you do is you say, I'm going to start, I'm going to assume, this is a trivial step, but I assume N is equal to 1. What, what does N mean? N without a subscript, the total amount. So I'm going to assume I have one kilomole of the mixture. So if I do that, how much of, oh, well, I'll have 0.7 kilomoles of CO2. I'll have 0.2 kilomoles and 0.1 kilomole. I take and I multiply N times big M to make a new column, 0.7 times 44. What does that tell me? That's how many kilograms that I have of that one, right? And then I'll have 0 0.2 times 32 and 0 0.1 times 28. If I sum them up, what do I have? The total M. So if I want the mass fraction, I say M of that component divided by the total M. So M sub I, it's whatever this is right there, divided by whatever that is right there. And that's how I do it in a spreadsheet. It keeps it clear. And so then it would be 0 0.2 times 32 divided by big M, or not big M, but the total mass of the mixture. What is then the molar mass of the mixture? Well, what's the definition? It's how many kilograms of mass I have per how much gas in amount I have. Well, I assumed with the start of one, so it's Whatever this sum is divided by 1, that's how you get the molar mass of that mixture. If I start playing with these mass fraction or mole fractions, the y's, I will get a different molar mass of the mixture. We also talk about Dalton's model. It's a concept of partial pressures. This is uh, very useful, and a lot of times that's how... Uh, ga ideal gas mixtures are described, people will talk about the partial pressures. So consider a, a mixture of several ideal gases and they have a total pressure equal to the sum of, so the total pressure is equal to the sum of the partial pressures or the pressures exerted by each of the constituents as if they were alone at the same temperature 
and volume as the original mixture. So these are what we call partial pressures. For example, consider only a two components mixture. I tried to color code them, red and blue. Think about the temperature and the volume of that mixture and the total pressure of that ideal gas mixture. Now if you take for the same volume and the same volume and the same temperature and the same temperature, you won't get the same pressure if you're able to magically isolate and only have this red component in, in that same volume at the same temperature. It, the red component will have a lower pressure and that pressure will be the partial pressure of that component. Likewise, this is the blue. If you have all of the blue isolated, separate out the red, get them out of there, and you have them at the same volume, same temperature, then you'll have the partial pressure of the blue. And the sum of those partial pressures, maybe I should have color coded this or said this is red and this is blue. If you add those, you get back the original pressure, the original total pressure of the mixture. Okay. Let's uh, solve this problem. Molar analysis of a gas mixture is 40% nitrogen, 30% carbon dioxide, 30% what is CH4? Methane. It's methane. Uh, the gas mixture is at 330 Kelvin and 150 kilopascal. That's the total pressure of 150 kilopascal. Okay. Determine the mixture molar mass. Mixture molar mass. What is the symbol for what I'm going to calculate? Big M. Sometimes you'll add mix on it to distinguish it it's not the same as the molar mass of the nitrogen it's not the same as the molar mass of the carbon dioxide it's not the same as the molar mass of the methane but the book doesn't put mix on it just big m without a subscript or anything it's just a mixture molar mass well how would i calculate it well it's going to depend on the molar mass of each of the constituents of the methane of the CO2, carbon dioxide, and of the nitrogen. And what you just do is, it's just the sum of, so the molar, it's the mass frac, I'm sorry, not the mass fraction, it's the mole fraction times the molar mass of each of those constituents. That's how you calculate the mixture molar mass. All right? So for this case, you'd say, 40% times the molar mass of nitrogen. What's the molar mass of nitrogen? You have to look it up, 28.02. Carbon dioxide, you have to look it up, 44. I can't remember the other digits on it. Let's take a look. For carbon dioxide, molar mass is 44.01. And for the methane, you can always estimate them for every carbon there's 12 for every hydrogen, there's one. So 12 plus four, it's around 16 for methane, 16.04. And there you go. Let's look at part B, analysis in terms of mass fractions. Really what I probably should have done is started a table, shouldn't I? I should have started a table, I should have said, look at. Why don't we put the nitrogen as one of the components in the table, the carbon dioxide as one of the components, and the methane as one of the components. Put the molar mass, and it's uh, 28.02, 44.01, 16.04. Put the given mole fractions, 40%, 30%, 30%, 40%, 40%. Thirty percent. Check that they do add up to one hundred percent. That's good. <coughs> do the multiplication of y times the m. So it'll be 0.4 times 28.02, whatever that result is. 0.3 times 44.01, whatever that result is. 
0.3 times 16.04, whatever that result is, and then sum them up. And when you sum them up, what is the answer right here? That's the mixture molar mass. All right. Well, uh, what then is the mass fraction? The mass fraction is going to be uh, the, the, a way to interpret y times m is if I had a mixture of one original kilomole, if I had that as the mixture, this would be the mass of each component, which would be y, the mole fraction, times the molar mass. And so the mass fraction will be this 0 0.4 times 28.02 divided by that mixture molar mass, which is calculated as the sum of that column. And it, it would be 0 0.3 times 44.01. Let's do this. Somebody calculate and run what is that mixture molar mass. Okay, 20 what? 29.22? Is that good? And then let's go ahead and use that 29.22 and calculate then the mass fraction for the nitrogen. 0.383 and then the mass fraction of the carbon dioxide, if you have a calculator, in the mass fraction, point one six four. Now the time of truth. Add them up. Do the mass fractions need to sum to 100%? If they don't, look for your error. True? And so does that sum to 100%? It doesn't? You get uh, 1.00 what? No, it gets, it gets 0 .001 away. You just didn't rhyme one of those. It gets to 100. It gets to 100, yeah. okay, yeah. Or get four digits to each of those, or five digits to each of those, okay? Don't round them off and keep all your digits and your calculations. But the sum of the mass fractions need to add up to 100, just like the sum of the mole fractions equal to 100%. So there is uh, the mass fractions as percentages. What about the partial pressure of each component? Well, I need the partial pressure of nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and methane. Well, all you have to do is say it's going to be the mole fraction times that total gas pressure initial. The total gas pressure initial is 150 pascal. So it's going to be, for the first one, it'll be 0 0.4 times 150. These are units of kilopascal. These are units of kilogram. These are units of kilogram per kilomole. And then 0.3 times 150 kilopascal and then 0.3 times 150 kilopascal. So, 45, 45, 60, and should they add up? Should the sum of the partial pressure is equal to the total pressure? Sure, so it's a good check. So. It's 60 kilopascal, 45 kilopascal, and 45 kilopascal are the partial pressures. All right, part D, what is the volume occupied by 1.8 kilomoles of the mixture in meter cubes? So you want to calculate that volume. So the volume occupied by the mixture, it, all three of them are ideal gases, so the mixture behaves as an ideal gas. So I could use the ideal gas equation Maybe the equation is PV equal to number, total number of moles times R bar T. That would work. 
would it, would it, would it not work? So let's do this. Uh, you have uh, number of moles R bar T divided by P. It's 1.8 kilomole. That's the total number given in the problem statement. 1.8 kilomoles of mixture. R bar 8.314 kilo uh, Pascal meter cubed per kilo mole Kelvin. How many ways can you write R bar? You could write it kilojoules per kilomole Kelvin. Or you'd note that a kilojoule is a kilopascal meter cubed. Is that true? Is a kilojoule a kilopascal meter cubed? It's helpful, yeah. So sometimes we use the R bar, and sometimes it's useful to use kilopascal times meter cubed divided by kilomole Kelvin. And then the temperature, we want to put in 330 Kelvin, and the total pressure is 150 kilopascal. Notice that kilopascals go, kilomoles go, Kelvin go. You're left with meter cubed. So what is that volume? Somebody has a calculator. Let me see if other people can verify it. That's the second verification. Third, fourth, fifth. All right, five, six, good, 32.9. And that unit meter cube. Somebody says, uh, hmm, how else could I solve for it? Well, could you use this equation that PV is equal to MRT, where that R is R bar divided by the molar mass T. You're kind of going to go in circles, but yes, you can use a different form of the ideal gas equation, and it'll work. Well, um, but what is this cap M right here? The mixture molar mass, isn't it? And we just calculated that mixture molar mass to be uh, 29.22 kilograms per kilomole. True? Now, the problem gave us originally the amount, 1.8 kilomoles, but they could have told you how much is in kilogram. Actually, let's look at part E. It says now, what is the volume occupied by 29 kilograms? So you could solve for part E using this equation, where the volume is the mass. It's R bar T divided by pressure molar mass because you're going to take that mass, you're going to divide it by the molar mass, and you're back to the amount. I'm not trying to confuse you. I'm just trying to say sometimes people write the form of the ideal gas equation emphasizing amount, sometimes mass, but it really is back and forth. It's the same, as long as you're doing it correctly. So let's go ahead and compute for this one. So uh, it's going to be um, uh, 29 kilograms divided by 29.22 kilograms per kilomole. That's really, you can do that as a separate calculation. That would be the total number of moles, kilomoles. And then multiply by 8.314, multiply by 330, and divide by 150. We already chased those units on that, and you would get a total volume different. But what is that total volume for part E? Okay, only thing is, is I would have put that next digit maybe 
keep more digits on that intermediate calculation of the mixture mass, uh, mixture molar mass. Um, I don't know if that makes a big difference on this one, but I just ran that again. It's 29.223. So, and then my calculator shows a zero after that three, which I don't think is going to be much of a difference. Whoops. Uh, Uh, which I get 18.15. Is somebody 18.15? Okay, so 18.15. There you go. Thank you very much. Any questions on that problem? Well, less, but it's not, it's also used somewhat, but it's uh, not as popular as talking about partial pressures. You talk about partial volumes. Well, the volume fraction is equivalent to the mole fraction of an ideal gas mixture, so I guess talking about partial volumes is, is as popular. But uh, we would describe the discussion of partial volumes as uh, honoring Amagat. So, you would sometimes find in textbooks it's described as Amagat's model. It's very similar. You take a uh, mixture of ideal gases here, just red and blue, and they have a given temperature, a pressure, and a volume. And you conceptually separate it into pure ideal gas of blue at the same temperature as before, the same pressure as before as the mixture, but you'll find that that volume is reduced. It has to be a smaller volume, and this volume has to be reduced. So the volume of the red and the volume of the blue, if you add them up, is equal to the original total volume of the mixture. So there's the concept of partial volumes, partial volumes. And if you took that volume of the red divided by the total volume, what do you get? Mole fraction. The mole fraction of the red in that ideal gas mixture. Nitrogen at uh, 40 degrees C, 150 kilopascal, occupies a closed, rigid container having a volume of six, uh, no, four meter cubed. Six kilograms of oxygen are added to the container. Uh, the container is rigid. Did the size of the container increase even though you added more amount to it? No, it's a rigid container. The final temperature is 60 degrees C. So it's like initial state one, final state two. Uh, find the molar um, analysis of the final mixture. So everything is going to be looking at the final mixture, the gravimetric analysis of the final mixture, the apparent molar mass of the final mixture, the final mixture pressure, and the partial volume of nitrogen in the final mixture. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and organize the information given to us. So we have beginning with nitrogen, the temperature, 40 degrees C, that's uh, 300 273, add that, and so it's a uh, Kelvin. Right, that's 313 Kelvin. All right. The pressure, 150 kilopascal, that's the initial pressure of the nitrogen, and the volume of the tank. Um, let me just kind of put that over here. Volume is four meter cubed. You add six kilograms of oxygen. Okay, well, first of all, there's probably a few things we want to calculate. How much uh, nitrogen is originally in the system? Because nitrogen is not going away. It doesn't leak out. So how much nitrogen's in that system? I calculate it using the ideal gas equation. Would that be the pressure of the nitrogen? The uh, volume of the nitrogen divided by the ideal gas constant, universal ideal 
Yes, constant. And the temperature? Did I correctly apply the ideal gas equation? So let's go ahead and you, you run the number. You tell me what is the number of kilomoles of nitrogen in there originally. Let me get a couple verifications on that. One, two, three, four, five, six. Good. So now also you might want to know how much mass is, how much mass of the nitrogen's there. If that's the number of kilomoles, well, we're going to have to know that the molar mass of nitrogen is 28.0. What does the book use for this one? One or two? 28.02 kilograms per kilomole. So you get is that what you get? So if I have 0 0.2306 kilomoles I have 6.4605 kilograms. Do you agree? This, is, this book uses 28.01, doesn't it? Some books I've seen 28.02, so uh, let me go back and fix that. So, it does make a difference when you start playing with the fourth significant digit on numbers. True? So, you don't want to play, have a uh, uncertainty about that fourth significant digit on the molar mass and then compute the mass to five significant digits. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. All right. Um, so what is uh, the molar analysis of the final mixture? Well, um, let's take a look and focus now on the six kilograms of oxygen that are added. So oxygen, what's the molar mass of the oxygen? This is the molar mass of the nitrogen. The O2 molar mass, 32.00 kilograms per kilomole. You're given the mass of oxygen, which is six kilograms, so calculate the number of moles of the oxygen. Is that true? One good? Half of this is just hands-on exercise, right? Is, is it working for you? All right, so what is the total number of moles in the mixture? Point four one eight one, And at that point, now I can go back and I can calculate the mole fraction of the nitrogen in that final mixture will be the point 0.2306 divided by that point 0.4181 and it's 55.15 I'll round it off to 55.2 percent and the mole fraction of the oxygen I'll just run it two ways to compare forty four point nine or forty four point eight percent they both sum up to a hundred so we're done with part A 
the gravimetric analysis of the final mixture. Well, you're asked to calculate the mass fraction of the nitrogen and the mass fraction of the oxygen. So what is that mass fraction? Well, what's the total mass? 6 plus. So it's 12.458. And uh, we'll have that's fifty one point eight percent. And forty eight point two percent. Does everybody agree? A couple of agreements. Good, good. All right. What's the apparent molar mass of the mixture? Well, that's our big M of the mixture. Is every time you think of this mixture molar mass, it's how many kilograms per how many kilomoles. True? It's a ratio. So you have the information laying right there. We know that we have. 12.458 uh, kilograms of the mixture, and on, in that mixture it's 0 0.4181 kilomoles. So wouldn't that ratio give us an apparent molar mass? So what's the apparent molar mass? 25.8 seven. Twenty five point eight seven? Did you get that? I must have typed in something wrong. Twenty nine point uh, seven nine seven so I would round that off to round that off to twenty nine point eight oh units of kilogram per kilomole. Notice uh, the mixture molar mass should be between the two components. If you have a, just two components, should be between the lighter one and the heavier one. And uh, so it's between 28 and 32. That looks good. What's the final pressure in the mixture? I'll just come down here. The final pressure could be calculated by the total number of moles, R bar, T divided by the total volume. True? Total number of moles, 0.4181. I'm going to skip the units, but uh, we would want you to make sure be confident of your units. And then uh, 313 Kelvin, and the total volume is 4 cubic meter. I'm sorry? Oh, that's right. It went up. The final temperature is 300 and what? 30? 33 Kelvin. 333 Kelvin. Very good. Thank you. You caught me from an embarrassing mistake. What do we have for an answer? We have a pressure of 289 kilopascal. So put it up here. And then what is the partial volume of the nitrogen in the final mixture? Partial volume of the nitrogen in the volume mixture. Did you not get 289? You got it? Okay. What's the partial volume? Well, is the partial volume of the nitrogen in the mixture equal to the mole fraction of the nitrogen in the mixture times the total volume? Sure. And so the mole fraction 
was 55.2%. It multiplied by a volume of 4. And it's 30.3 meter cubed is the partial volume. This is kind of an exercise of making sure and working through. You change it up a little bit and you have to know what your definitions are of each of the terms and how to relate them. Shall I give you a minute or should we press forward? Yes, sir. Yes. How did I get the 55.2 and the 44.8? Well, uh, the, the, this is the amount of the uh, nitrogen, this is the amount of the oxygen, this is the sum of them, so the total amount. And so the mole fraction of the nitrogen is going to be the amount of the nitrogen divided by the total amount. Yeah. All right. Look good? Uh, yeah, that's wrong then, isn't it? How did I get that? So 4 times 0 0.552, 2.21 meter cubed. True? Thank you. Well, sometimes, you know. Well, we want to be able to calculate uh, and perform analyses where we have an ideal gas mixture undergoing a, a process and a closed system analysis or flowing through a device and an open system analysis. We're going to have to evaluate changes in U, especially for a closed system analysis, changes in H for an open system analysis, and then changes in S for both of those types of systems close and open system analysis for ideal gas mixtures. And then also, a lot of times they like to use specific heats. It simplifies it. So how do we calculate the change in the total internal energy, U2 minus U1? Well, the total internal energy at state 2 would be the sum of the contributions from each component at 2. This is at state 2. Minus the sum of the masses times the specific, that's the internal energy per unit mass, for each component at state 1. Okay. Uh, somebody says, I'd like to not use U, but I'd like to use U bar. What is U bar? It's per unit amount instead of per unit mass. True? So just a reminder, what are the units on lowercase u? Kilojoules per kilogram. And what about the units on u bar? Kilojoules per kilomole. So if I multiply by n, the amount of each component, maybe I should stay in the same color, sum them up over all of the components evaluated at state 2, I'd have it. So the sum of n u-bars minus the sum of uh, n u-bars for each component at the initial state 1. So you can either go by a mass description to calculate the change in u or a molar description. Now, uh, what happens if I take the whole equation and I say I want the total mixture mass outside of the sum of these masses of each component times the internal energy of each component evaluated at the final temperature minus the sum, the mass of each component, internal energy of each component uh, for the uh, initial state. Well. If I pull a mass out, I need to put a mass right there. But what is that ratio, mi over m? Mass fractions. So you can get it where this is the mixture mass. And then you have the sum of the mass fractions. Well, 
um, this can also be as the mixture mass times, which would be a uh, U2 minus U1 on a mass basis, where this U2 is equal to the sum of the mass fractions of each component times U at state 2. You could do the same thing for the uh, molar description. You could pull out the total number of moles. Then you would have the sum of the yi u bars and uh, for each component minus the sum of yi u bars at state 2, at state 1 for each component, which would be total mixture amount times U2 minus U1 bar for the mixture. All right. Well, while we're at it, um, if it's truly an ideal gas mixture, are these U's a function of temperature and pressure, a function of temperature only, a function of pressure only, or what? Internal energy for an ideal gas. Temperature only. Temperature only. So we can get rid of that for ideal gas. It's a function of temperature only. And is it a good approximation? It is. If you wanted to calculate the change in internal energy on a mass basis, it could be approximated by C sub V change in temperature because it's a function of temperature only. It's just that it may be temperature dependent, and so you may have a, a look up a temperature dependent C sub V, but it's a property C sub V delta T. So this brings up that uh, you, you could, uh, here, let me try and rewrite it over here. U2 minus U1 would be the total mass times U2 minus U1, or the total mass C sub V. T2 minus T1. How would we calculate that C sub V? Well, it's going to be a mixture specific heat constant volume. It'll be the sum of the mass fractions of each component times the specific heat constant volume for each component. Um, likewise, if you wanted to work on a molar basis, you could have the amount times U2 bar minus U1 bar, and you have the amount times C sub V bar times T2 minus T1. What is C sub V bar? Some of the mole fractions times C sub V of the components. What would be another way of relating these two? Well, if I took uh, the C sub V on a I have it per unit mass basis, right? Just look at the units, kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin, where C sub V bar, kilojoules per kilomole Kelvin. If I took the C sub, well, let's do it this way. C sub V bar is C sub V of the mixture times the molar mass of the mixture everything in that equation of the mixture. So you can talk about the specific heat per unit mass, specific heat per unit amount, and then the thing that ties them together, go back and forth, is the mixture molar mass. Well, the same for the enthalpy. If you understand U's, you understand H's because U's a function of temperature only, H is a function of temperature only. The only trip trick up, the tricky part is entropy. Let's talk about entropy for a minute. So if I wanted to, which, let me try and draw it this way. On a change in entropy on a molar basis or molar description and a change in the entropy, the total entropy, on a mass, using mass description. Okay, so somebody says calculate 
S final minus S initial for a process where an ideal gas mixture is undergoing a process. How, how, do we, how would we do that? Well, we would say we would take the sum of each component of that mixture and calculate its change in the in specific entropy, but not per unit mass, but per unit amount. All right. So the sum of n sub i's, this, this delta s bar can be expressed as s bar naught at state 2 minus s bar naught at state 1 minus r bar natural log of p2i divided by p1i. Do you recognize the equation we just used? How do we calculate the change in entropy for a particular component as it undergoes a process from the process one from state one, which typically is described by T1, P1, to the final state two, described by temperature two, pressure two? Okay. Let's go through this. Um, this S1 naught, S bar naught one, is that a function of temperature one only, function of temperature one, pressure one, a function of temperature one, temperature two, a function of temperature one, uh, pressure one, temperature two, pressure two, what's it a function of? Temperature one only. What does that not right here indicate? It's low pressure, atmospheric pressure. So if you take a look in the textbook, in the tables of the textbook, and we go back to pick one of those tables, it really doesn't matter. Let's take a look at table A23. A23. You'll have it says ideal gas properties of selected gases. So these gases behave as ideal gases. All right. And they have the carbon dioxide, they have the carbon monoxide, they have the water, etc. But they have a column for each of the carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide and water vapor. They have an H bar column. That's the enthalpy as a function of temperature. Just temperature goes down. This, that's not necessarily the one I'm interested in, nor the U bar. But I'm really interested in this S bar naught. That's what I'm looking for, the S bar naught. So we have S bar naught, S bar naught. Okay, what exactly again is that S bar naught? If you look at the top of that table, what does it say right there? What does it say right there? Absolute entropy at the low pressure of 1 atm. I put in low pressure, but it's that ambient pressure, 1 atm. That's what that S bar not, that not means on it, okay? Okay. So we, we're, we're refreshing our memory of how to calculate changes in entropy for ideal gases on a molar basis. The next thing is, uh, so this is not true, not true, not true. It's a function of temperature one only, just like the S bar naught two is a function of T two only. But let's take a look over here. What is P two I? What is P two I? Is it Y sub I times P two? the partial pressure of that component at the final pressure. How would we calculate it? We'd say, what's the mole fraction? Gives us the final pressure. How about P1i? Y sub i P1. In this whole chapter, we do not deal with reacting ideal gas fixtures. Guess what happens the next chapter? 
reacting ideal gas mixtures. For this whole chapter, it's a lot easier because if we have a mixture that doesn't react and it's just a, undergoing a process, a closed system, I'm not mixing two gas streams and having to worry about mixing, but for a closed system, a lot of times the Y's cancel and it'll just be P2 over P1. And it, pretty much every semester, some student be solving homework problems, they'll visit me and they'll say, I don't understand why this problem, the, it's just they substitute sometimes in that natural log the absolute pressure P2 over P1, and they don't go and calculate the partial pressures and put them in. Well, it's because the mole fractions, Y sub I's, didn't change because it just took a, a closed system and maybe beat it up by decreasing the volume and heating it up, changing its temperature, did something with pressure and temperature, changed from initial state one to final state two, but the mole fraction didn't change. That's why sometimes it looks deceiving. Okay, so I think we understand everything there. How about if we do it on a, on a mass description? S2 minus S1 is equal to, those are lower, uppercase S's, uh, the sum of the, the amounts in mass times S2 minus S1 for each of those components. But is there a bar over those lowercase S's? No, 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 no. How would I calculate those? changes in it would be the sum of m times s naught at 2 minus s naught at 1 minus r natural log p2i over p1i summed over i's make sense uh, is that p2i the same as what's in the other equation that's the same, isn't it? Yeah. Um, is this R the same? No, it's not. What's the difference? Related by the molar mass. So if I wanted to, I would say that uh, R is equal to R bar divided by the molar mass. Is that true? Yeah, that's true. Okay, uh, so these were the same, yes. How about the S naughts and the S bar naughts? They're functions of temperature, but they're related by the molar mass. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, when you calculate changes in entropy for an ideal gas, it's not just a function of temperature only, it's a function of temperature and pressure. Makes it a little more calculate, uh, complex. Well, I'm going to skip this problem, and I'm going to go ahead and save this recording, and then what we'll do is pick up in a minute here, okay? So let me do that. So once you're able to describe changes in internal energy, enthalpy, entropy, and describe ideal gas mixtures, it's time to apply. And so we can have an ideal gas mixture undergoing a process. So a closed system that undergoes a process. That's pretty common. Or if you have an open system and you have maybe a stream coming in, a stream coming out, two streams coming in, one stream going out, now you're equipped to analyze uh, the same types of problems you did before, but you only had refrigerant, pure refrigerant, or pure water, or something like that. Here you can analyze the same thing. You can have flow, ideal gas mixture through a turbine, through a pump. Well, you would call it a compressor, not a pump, because it's an ideal gas mixture. Through a nozzle, through a diffuser, through a heat exchanger, and things like that. An ideal gas mixture has a molar analysis of 50% nitrogen and 50% carbon dioxide. It is cooled at constant pressure from an initial temperature of 500 to a final temperature of 300 Kelvin. Determine the heat transfer in kilojoules per kilogram of the mixture and the work. So, 
Think about ideal gas mixture. It's cooled at constant pressure. A lot of times we'll set up a little illustration of a piston cylinder. The piston weight dictates the pressure. And we're focusing on the trapped amount of substance. And here it's an ideal gas mixture. And it starts off at state one where you have the temperature of 500 Kelvin and it undergoes cooling constant pressure that's what that piston does it gives it constant pressure and we still have the focus of the study being that ideal gas mixture and the final temperature is 300 Kelvin and does it tell us what the pressure is no. Does it tell us what the, how much mass there is of the nitrogen or mass of the mixture? No. But they, they want us to calculate the heat transfer per kilogram of the mixture. We can do that. We've done that before. Okay. So let's apply the first law to the process. It's a closed system. And so what would it look like? Well, the amount of heat transferred in from initial to final state, Q1 to 2, minus the work out, 1 to 2, equal to the change in the internal energy, change in kinetic energy, change in potential energy. Let's drop the Ke change and the Pe change, so it's just a change in internal energy, true? What about this uh, work? 1 to 2. Is the work 1 to 2 equal to the integral of P dV? Is it boundary work? Sure, let's do it that way. And if it's constant pressure, we love it. Let me calculate boundary work every day with a constant pressure process. True? So we get that it's just simply P times V2 minus V1, and when we flip it to the other side, we'll get Q1 to 2 is equal to U2 minus U1 um, uh, plus P2 V2 minus P1 V1. I know that you've seen this before. So you have Q1 to 2 is described as a change in the enthalpy. So if I want to calculate that heat transfer, it's a change in the enthalpy. Okay. How do I do it? Well, I look. I have an ideal gas mixture. I have a molar description given. I can work on a mass. I can work on a molar. It really doesn't matter. Um, it would be equal to the uh, the uh, sum of the mole fractions times the change in the well the total amount in moles times the change in H2 minus H bar 1 sub I or it would be M times the sum of the mass fractions times H2 minus H1 I molar description delta H bars or mass description delta H without the bars. All right. So uh, you, could, you could also mix and match a little bit, but uh, how do you want to do this? Let's, let's do it this way. If I have the total number of moles and I have the molar mass of the mixture isn't that the total amount of the mixture but I have to have the molar mass to keep the equation good that I have the sum of the mole fractions of each component but let me bust that sum out because I only have two components so we're going to have the mole fraction of the nitrogen 
the H bar at state 2 minus H bar at state 1 for the nitrogen plus the mole fraction of the carbon dioxide H bar 2 minus H bar 1 of the carbon dioxide. So Q1 to 2. So lowercase q is equal to 1 over the mole fraction, uh, not mole fraction, motor mass of the mixture times everything in that bracket. We can start to put terms in for this um, or make some intermediate calculations. What is the mole fraction of the mixture? It's going to be the mole fraction of the nitrogen times the motor mass of the nitrogen plus the mole fraction of the carbon dioxide, the molar mass of the carbon dioxide. Is that true? That look okay? Pardon? <laughs> All right, well, no, no, we'll just leave it here. So let's put in uh, 0.5 times the mole mass of the nitrogen, 28.0, oh, uh, what was it, at one or two on this book? One, thank you. Plus uh, 44.01 again for the carbon dioxide. CO2, CO2, yeah, 44.01, well, half times that. All right, so what do you get for the molar mass? 36.01, that's the mixture molar mass. So we know that one. Let me, let me go ahead and write this equation out so I don't have to hopefully botch it up too bad. So it's 1 over 36.01. What are the units on this? Kilogram per kilomole, true? Is that the units on that? Okay. Now, um, what is the mole fra 0 0.5? I have to get the molar enthalpy of nitrogen at the final temperature of 500. You could use the table A23 at 500 Kelvin. The molar enthalpy is 14,581. How about the molar enthalpy at 300 Kelvin? 300 Kelvin, 8,723. What are the units on those? I'm going to put the units outside the bracket because every term in here has the same units. Let's do it for the carbon dioxide. 0.5 again times the molar enthalpy at 500 for the carbon dioxide. Why did I put a bracket like that? 17,000. 678 minus the molar enthalpy at 300, 9431, and that's all kilojoules per kilomole. Now we see how the kilomoles cancel, and we're going to be left with lowercase q in the right units of kilojoules per kilogram. It, it's, it's right at 196 uh, kilojoules per kilogram of that mixture. All right. How about the work? Well, actually, part A was hard. <laughs> the work was pretty easy, isn't it? Uh, I, I, we already substituted for this boundary work before. How do you want to handle that boundary work? Well, could we do it this way? Let me try and tuck it in down here. The uh, specific lo work, lowercase w, would be equal to the constant pressure times the change in the specific volume. That makes sense? But we always know PV is equal to RT, right? PV is equal to RT. So this is equal to RT2 minus T1. Is that R bar or R? That's R. Which is, I need to get uh, the 
R bar divided by the mixture molar mass T2 minus T1. And R bar is easy, 8.314 kilojoules. This time it's more convenient instead of putting kilopascal meter cube, put kilojoules per kilomole Kelvin. Then we have the molar mass of 36.01 kilograms per kilomole. And then the temperature difference, it went from um, 300 to 500. There's a 200 Kelvin temperature difference. The Kelvins cancel. Kilograms don't cancel. That's what I want the, the answer to be in. But the kilomoles cancel. And we're left with the lowercase specific work in units of kilojoules per kilogram of the mixture to come in at 30, no, 46. Kilogram. All right, I, uh, the final temperature is not 500 Kelvin, is it? What is the, from 500 to 300. So I messed up my sign. This is supposed to be negative, and this is negative, okay? It's a negative 200, and these are switched in location, sorry. It, it, uh, T1 is 500, T2 is 300. I had switched them. So it's a negative Q and a negative W. The magnitudes are correct. It's just heat transfer out, and the work, the boundary work, the system's being compressed by the surroundings. All right, any comments? Yes, sir. Um, can you work out how you can use units for the line of, the last line of uppercase Q? Do you have your parentheses N times M as one over M? Yeah, this is replaced uh, and put over here, and that's lowercase m. Uh, the amount times the molar mass is lowercase m. So then that becomes lowercase q. So cap Q divided by the mass is specific heat transfer. Right. All right. So what we can do now is start to really apply it to the last half of this chapter, which is the psychrometric applications. What's psychrometrics? Let me go through this. Psychrometrics or psychrometry or hygrometry uh, is a term used to describe the field of engineering. Oh, that's always nice. Field of engineering concerned with the physical and thermodynamic properties of gas vapor mixtures. It's the ideal gas mixture. But the real mixture of interest is dry air and water vapor. Air, moist air, the study of moist air. And we're going to get down to a nice chart the psychrometric chart, but it's like anything else. Uh, there's a few places in the world where I think they eat their desserts first before the main meal. Is it, has anybody been in a culture like that? It's like, no, no, let's not eat the, the meal first. Let's have our sweets, our dessert first. Well, this is our dessert. When you have a nice chart, it makes life easy. But uh, we have to earn our dessert. And we have a lot to go through to really understand the study of moist air. And we have to do it, and we have to do it correctly. Dry air. So let's start there. Dry air has no moisture, no H2O. And a lot of times I'll put H2O V. What's a lowercase v on that H2O? Vapor. Vapor. Because we don't have to We're not studying. We're, we're in a chapter, ideal gases. Ideal gas mixture, so everything's going to behave as an ideal gas. So first of all, we have dry air. It's made up of nitrogen, oxygen, some argon, but very little, a little bit of carbon dioxide, and other things. 
And this would be its traditional makeup of dry air, 78.08% nitrogen, 21.95% oxygen, almost a percent argon, less than 0.03 carbon dioxide, and 0.01% other things. What other things? You could have a little methane in that air. Yeah, you could have some other. You don't want carbon monoxide. That's terrible. But uh, what else could you have? I don't know. Helium. Uh, you can then ask question, what would be the molar mass of the dry air? Given these mole fractions, you can go ahead and calculate it's around 28.97. 28.97 what? Kilograms of that mixture per kilomole of that mixture. Calculate the density of dry air at one atmosphere pressure and 25 degrees C and all right so uh, can we use the ideal gas equation something like uh, P V is equal to uh, M um, R uh, T or P is equal to Rho R T or Rho is equal to uh, P and if you this this is M R bar divided by the molar mass of T um, equal to uh, rho uh, R bar divided by the molar mass of T so P molar mass divided by R bar T and we said it's 1 atm oh about 101 kilopascal I know you could put whoops 101.3 if you want more digits on that 28.97, where'd that come from? Well, some things you just use so often you know it. Kilograms per kilomole. What about 8.314 kilopascal meter cubed per kilomole Kelvin? And then the 298 Kelvin. You've done this so many times, you don't even know why anybody at the university level would ask you a question like that. You're getting excessively bored. Your, int your intelligence is being insulted. Uh, and it comes in at 6. C. No? It didn't come in at C? It did. OK. But uh, and these are the type of calculations you do a lot, uh, especially in when you're working with ideal gas mixtures in this chapter. Let's take a look. All right, 45%. Now that we have the study of or what dry air is, the molar mass, it's made up of mm, primarily nitrogen, the next component oxygen, the next component argon, the next component carbon dioxide. And if you had some abnormal dry air, there could be other things in there because of some source. But we study now adding water vapor. So we're going to say the moist air is dry air all that stuff, but we're just going to call it dry air. It's lumped together. Dry air plus water vapor. That's it. That's what moist air is. Now, can you put in as much water vapor as you want into dry air and become moist air, moist air, and then you just continue to increase the amount of water vapor? Or does it reach a limit when it's called saturated air? What's it saturated? It's at its maximum capacity to have water vapor in it. It's saturated air. So anywhere you have from dry air all the way up to saturated air, you have more H2O vapor, more water vapor in it. OK. So what happens if I have too much water vapor in my moist air. It's now saturated air, but what happens if I start to cool it, make it colder, 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 colder? What will happen? It'll do out, right? Yeah, you have enough experience knowing that. It'll do out, okay? So uh, what we have the concept of the total air pressure is made up of 
the dry air, partial pressure, and the partial pressure associated with the water vapor in the air. What do you think would be the partial pressure of the water vapor in the moist air mixture when it's saturated? What would be its maximum? It would be a max, maximum, and that value for the water's partial pressure would be the Help me with the word first table or second table in this thermodynamics textbook. You have a steam table and you have temperature column. The next column over is the saturation pressure. It would be P sat, the saturation pressure. And does the saturation pressure for water depend on the temperature? Very, very strongly it depends on the temperature. That's why warm air or hot air can hold a lot of moisture. Cold air, even if it's holding as much moisture as it can, is still pretty dry to our skin and to our nasal passages and to our lungs. It's pretty dry. So this concept we have to review of vapor pressure. So if you have uh, liquid water and it's in a container and there's no air, nothing else in it, but you could have in the presence of gravity the liquid collect in the bottom and above it would be a vapor. What would be the vapor? If there's nothing but pure water, it would be the, the water in the vapor state. And yes, there's some equilibrium going back and forth where some of the molecules that are in the vapor are flying around and they hit the wall and they hit other molecules and they hit the wall but some of them hit the liquid surface and some of them kind of ricochet off the liquid surface some of them get smack and they stick into the liquid surface but then some of the liquid molecules at the surface go flying off into become vapor so there's an always an exchange happening an exchange but in equilibrium you would have some turning, going from vapor to liquid, some liquid to vapor, but the net would be no more changing. And then you would measure the pressure. And in here, that pressure would be the saturation pressure. It would be the vapor pressure. It would be that number that's reported in our steam table for steam. Let's say you switch this out to some refrigerant. Can I have the concept of a vapor pressure for the refrigerant? Sure. Would I look at the saturation table for the refrigerant, look up the saturation pressure, which is also called the vapor pressure, at a function of temperature? Sure. So this is not a really great plot here. I just grabbed it, but we've seen it in our textbook. This is the pressure as a function of temperature. And from, let's say, one point out to another point out, I forgot the name of those points, but there's a very important curve that's related or put that data is put into our table. It, we're above this vapor, below this, I'm sorry, above this is the uh, liquid and below this is the vapor state. And then if you wanted to complete the diagram, it goes like this. And what's over here is solid, solid state. So it's a PT diagram for substance, and this would be for water. And we're really interested in this line going from this point to that point, because what can happen is you go from liquid to vapor, or vapor to liquid, right? And so what is this point right here called? Ah, clicker question, huh? Clicker question? Is it the answer A? Is this point right here? Is it the um, triple, the melt, the solidification, the critical, or the uh, double point? So is it the triple point, the melt point, the solid point, the critical point, or the double point? And I turn on to, select, to start 
receiving your responses. That point right there. Triple point, melt point, solid point, critical point, or double point. Five seconds. Everybody in? And there we are. So let's just uh, see where it is, right? It's one of these recall. Either I remember it correctly or I don't. True? Let me ask this. Is, is, uh, is, what does this S represent right here? Solid. What does this L represent right here? What does this V represent? Vapor. It's kind of like the three phases, right? Gas phase, liquid phase, solid phase. True? Now, if I said that the temperature was this value and the pressure was this value, there's the point, right, where it matches up. What is the condition of the fluid at that point on this diagram? It's vapor. What if, if I said the temperature was this temperature and the pressure is this pressure and right there's that point, what would you say the, it's in the solid phase? Now, if I said the temperature is this one and the pressure is this one such that it's right there, Oh, it's on a special line. It's right on that line. What would you say it's a, the condition of the phase of the substance? It could, it's a two-phase mixture, some liquid, some vapor. We don't know how much. From this diagram, we'd have to look at another diagram to see if it's saturated liquid or saturated vapor, 50% liquid, 50% vapor, right? How about if I said it was this temperature and this pressure such that it's right on that line? It's two-phase. I can't tell how much is solid. I can't tell how much is liquid. But there's one little point on this whole diagram where you can't tell how much is liquid, how much is solid, how much is vapor, but it could all be present. What is that point? Right there. And why do they give it the name the triple point? Because all three phases could be present. Hopefully that helps. Does everybody know now the correct answer? A. Where is the critical point? Top, at the top. This right here is the critical point, right? It's where you have no more distinction above that temperature, above that pressure, no more distinction of a liquid in the presence of gravity from a solid in the presence of gravity. If you have a container of this substance, you'd shake it up and look at it, let it sit for a minute. Does it settle out where the liquid's in the bottom and the vapor's on the top? Nope. There's no more. It's kind of a mushy cloud, kind of a thick, syrupy, mushy cloud. How's that for a description? All right. So... I just made that up. This is the melt point. There's no solid point. There's no double point. But you got to have sort of crazy answers, don't you? Yeah, yeah you got five answers. Just, you could have made them up too. <laughs> All right. Uh, now we can go to our tables and get the temperature uh, as a function of pressure, or you can get an equation for it. People have curved fit these things. <coughs> Or the pressure implicitly is a function of temperature. This is Antoine equation. But we know how to get the data out of the tables. The vapor pressure of water at 1 atm and 25 degrees C is less than at 2 atm and 25 degrees C. Is that true? Or greater than half an atm at 25 degrees C or less than 1 ATF at 15 degrees C, blah, 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 blah. So the, this is a trick question, but see if you can, what you can do with it. All right, so we're uh, done with time. Uh, you know, I was thinking of uh, modifying this question a little bit. I was thinking uh, of adding to these uh, during uh, daylight hours, and then maybe putting this one during nighttime, and then maybe I put uh, during daylight hours, during nighttime, and then I thought, nah, uh, 
in the month of January, in the month of February. It doesn't really depend on if it's the month of January, February, or March. So, or does it depend on if it's daylight or nighttime? Does it really depend on this? 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 Let's go back and take a look at that PT diagram. Pressure temperature diagram. It comes, goes up, there's a point, goes up, goes a point, goes up, goes a point. We said these are really interesting because it's going from uh, liquid to vapor. What's this? This is a line of particular points where this is, gives us, depending on this temperature from the triple point temperature of the critical point, you can come in here with a bunch of different temperatures and get off this saturation pressure, that unique pressure, that unique pressure. All right? Is the saturation pressure a function of the temperature, whether it's daytime or nighttime, whether it's February or March? What, what's it a function of? Temperature. temperature. So what does a good multiple choice question do? Throws in bogus information, distractors, to get you all confused. This is all garbage. Now that you get rid of this pre pressure, now you can focus on, okay, the vapor pressure water at 25 degrees C is less than at 25. What? It's the same as at 25. That don't make sense. Greater than 25. What? The saturation pressure, PSAT, is a function of temperature only. You want to hear my one joke from my wife? I tell you every semester, right? So she worked with a guy who was given a particular name at his birth in South Texas. A lot of people go by just initials. That's AC. That's whatever. He was JT. So he joined the military around World War II, and they always have a rush of people going through, blah, blah, blah. What's your name, boy? J. J-A-Y. No, J only. So they put on the thing, J only. And then the next one, T, I'm J-T. Your middle initial, T, how do you spell that? T only. <laughs> Guess what he became after the parentheses were dropped? Jonely Tonely. <laughs> it took him years to get it corrected. But in the military, he was Jonely Tonely Smith, or whatever his last name was. <laughs> anyway, it's T only. It's T only. And you have to know, does this curve go up and then down? Or what does this curve do? It goes up, 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 up. True? So if I go increasing temperature, the pressure goes, the saturation pressure, the vapor pressure, it goes up. It goes up. So the vapor pressure, 25 degrees C, I compare it. Well, the only one that works is, the only one that works, isn't it? The vapor pressure of water at 25 degrees C is less than the vapor pressure of water at 35 degrees C. Yeah, the vapor pressure, the PSAT at 35 degrees C is greater than PSAT at 25 degrees C. Makes sense. Maybe I should have phrased it that way. But I didn't want it to make too much sense. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, B, but it's greater than the same temperature. If I say something like greater than 24 degrees C, that would have made sense. But how can the same value have a greater than the same value? What? That, I mean, it's one of these, the best answer, the best response. It's so definitely 35 is a higher temperature. It has a higher saturation pressure, et cetera. I know that was hard. Congratulations to the 14 percent that guessed correct. Did you get it? Okay, you got it. Congrats. Good. You did what? You were right too, but you were confused. 
<laughs> All right. Uh, consider saturated air at 20 degrees C and 101.3 kPa. Calculate the partial pressure of the water in that saturated air. So the key thing is, is, is this dry air or saturated air? Saturated air. It's at 20 degrees C temperature and it's at 101.3 kilopascal. Calculate the partial pressures of the first one is water, then the nitrogen and the oxygen. And, and for the nitrogen, assume that uh, the dry air is just two components, 79% is it nitrogen and 21% is oxygen. And then, oh, by the way, here's a little info. What's that? Extra information. For water at 20 degrees C, PSAT is just 2.0. 339 kilopascal. So what is the answer to part A? Is the partial pressure of the vapor um, greater than, or let me do it this way, less than, equal to, or greater than uh, 2.339 kPa? Clicker question, A, B, C. The answer for part A, the answer for part A, what is that partial pressure of the water? So maybe, I guess that's a good way of writing it, W-A-T-E-R, partial pressure of the water. Is it less than 2.339 kPa, equal to or greater than? I'll start it, and now you have 30 seconds. All right. So... Well, it's saturated air, isn't it? It can't hold any more than that. And so the partial pressure of the water in the mixture is the maximum that it could be. It's the saturation pressure. It's, it's equal. Okay, now what about the nitrogen? Well, we have a total pressure made up of the pressure of the dry air and the pressure of the vapor in the air. And the pressure of the dry air then is equal to the total pressure minus the vapor pressure. So that's 101.3 minus 2.339 all in kPa. But that Partial pressure of the dry air is due to two components. Maybe I could have written it like this. I could have said, hey, that's equal to the partial pressure of the, of the nitrogen plus the partial pressure of the oxygen plus the partial pressure of the vapor. True. But if you know the mole fractions of the nitrogen in the dry air and the mole fraction of the oxygen in the dry air, then go ahead and get the partial pressure of the dry air then the pressure of the nitrogen is that mole fraction of the nitrogen in the dry air times the partial pressure of the dry air. And so this then becomes 0.79 times 101.3 minus 2.339 kPa. And what do you get for that one? 70.18 kilopascal. And then the partial pressure of the oxygen would be 0.21 times 70. And that's a 20.7 20. 20.7 20. All right, I'll have to just 0.79 divide 0.21 times. 20.78 kilopascal. And then here we'll just put that the partial pressure of the water vapor was 2.34 kilopascal. I round it off a little bit. If I sum them up, what should I get? Back to 101.3. Okay. If I sum them up, I should get back to 101.3. Do you get back to 
Two yeses. Yes. Yes. Three. Good. Yes. Yes. Four. Perfect. Five. Thank you very much. So this was the answer for part A. This was the answer for part B. This is the answer for part C. Okay. Calculate the density of saturated air at 1 atm and 25 degrees C. What are we asked to calculate? Rho, the density. Well, what is that? Is that the mass per unit volume? Sure is. Now, you could tack this problem a lot of different ways. You could assume a volume of one cubic meter. You could work that way if you wanted to, right? But you need to calculate that density of the saturated air. So if I assume one cubic meter, that may be simpler. Then I think, okay, I have the mass of the mixture. What's it made up? I need to get the mass of the vapor in that mixture and the mass of the dry air in that mixture, don't I? Now, the, the mass of the vapor, it always behaves as an ideal gas. Can I use the ideal gas equation? Thinking that I have a cubic meter of volume and it's at this temperature, 25 degrees C, which is 298 Kelvin. Uh, man, that's terrible. Near the edge, I can't write 298 Kelvin. And a pressure of 1 atm. But that's the total pressure. Okay, let's convert that to 101.3 kilopascal. Fine. Okay. If I wanted to calculate the mass of the vapor, the ideal gas in that what I'd have to do is I'd have to get the uh, different forms of the equation, but the partial pressure of the vapor, the total volume occupied by both the vapor and the dry air, but it's because I have the partial pressure concept, I don't need a partial volume concept. It's the partial pressure of the vapor in the total volume of the mixture times the molar mass of the vapor divided by R bar, the absolute temperature. I don't have any partial temperature concept. I'm so thankful for that. I have a partial volume concept. I have a partial pressure concept. But there is no partial temperature concept in these gas mixtures, which is good. All right. So I have to, get, I have to do a little work here. What is the... Uh, partial volume of the vapor, partial pressure of the vapor. It's saturated air. So what is this PV equal to? Is it the saturation pressure at 25 degrees C? Yes or no? Is it? And so what is, uh, did I have that on the last problem? I can't remember what the number is. Okay, it's uh, 3.169 kPa. True or false? Okay. This, uh, so we, let me put in the number, 3.169 kPa. What about the volume? I'm going to start it with one meter cubed. All right. Ah, it's terrible, can't write. One meter cube. What about the molar mass of vapor? 18.02. You have to look it up. What's water's 18.02 kilograms per kilomole? All right. What is our bar? 8.314 kilopascal meter cube per kilomole Kelvin. What is T? Temperature 295. No, I mean, sorry, 298 Kelvin. Let's make sure. Kilomoles go, kilopascal go, meters cube go. And what did we calculate? 203. 2, 3. All right, but give me it to three significant digits. Zero? Four? 
Good. At least four digits. You want after the four is zero five? Four eight. Even better. Even better. That's good. Keep more digits. This is in uh, kilograms. Now you do the same thing, the mass of the dry air. It will be the partial pressure. Now, what's the partial pressure? This 1 atm is 101.3 kilopascal. So we have 101.3 minus 3.169. That's the partial pressure of the dry air. We have the 1 meter cubed volume, the assumption. We have 28.97 for the dry air. We have 8.314 and the same temperature, 298. And you get a mass of the dry air. True? Okay. <clears throat> and then what do we do? We go ahead and say the total mass is the sum. And then we just calculate the density right there. So somebody give me the final answer. Round it off to three. This will be kilograms of mixture per meter cubed because we assumed it was one meter cubed. 1.15. Thank you. I see I'm out of time, and so we're going to go ahead and stop. Thank you very much for your attention. Savannah, do you want to make an announcement?